Well, the, the next hand we have, you think you played well as well, and it's a uh, pretty unconventional hand. It's not exactly aces. You had, uh, it was a six-handed table again, and you had nine-six of clubs under the gun, and you decide to pop it up. <laughs> What's the deal? Actually, actually, um, it's, it's a, a six-handed table, and everyone had just sat down, but this hand was actually played heads up because there's no one else had sat in yet. Um, they had all just sat in the table, so this is just like gotcha. a quick hand. Me and, and my opponent were playing. Um, but basically, uh, I raised it to nine six of clubs on the button, which is pretty standard heads up. You should be doing that like 100% of the time, pretty much. So not unconventional but, at all. <laughs> So you ended up calling his re-raise, and the flop comes down ace, nine, five, uh, with two clubs. So you have both a uh, mid-pair and a flush draw. Yeah, um, he bets out 325, which, I mean, you know, he do that with, with most of his hands, with almost all of his hands. He might even do that with, with hands that are actually slightly better than mine, but not that didn't flop an ace. So I think, because especially a lot of players will see that there anyway, even if they, uh, even if they have pocket kings or pocket So this is basically a case in point for don't be results oriented and base base all of your 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 rating of your decisions on the situation at hand and whether or not you think you played it correctly given the information. Right. Um, and even when they do have me crush, it's still nine out, so it's not, not the end of the world. 
to call off another three thousand getting getting like I don't know uh, I don't know I don't know the exact odds I can't tell with the hand history but pretty, you know pretty close to two to one right. Well, and you also can't be too disappointed with the results when turn comes a club and you take it down for about 9K. Yeah, so. that, was, that was also a... <laughs> That's a plus. <laughs> yeah, that well, let's go ahead and get to the next hand then. Um, yeah, sure. Next hand you're playing heads up, and this is uh, an opponent that we talked about before in the hand that you didn't think you played well. Um, so you're playing heads up against him, and you get dealt uh, big slick ace, king offsuit. Uh, go ahead and uh, tell us what happened pre-flop. Yeah, actually, this is sort of strange. I, uh, he raised and I sent him just a call, and I do this once in a while, just to sort of um, mix it up and, and occasionally um, to get to a situation for a swap. If you have ace king, you just call their, 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 their raise. Um, if you actually swap a big hand, you know, they'll automatically in their head say to themselves, okay, well, he can't have ace king because he just called free flop. Um, right. So, you know, I mean, I, I say I do this less than one out of ten times, but I do do it occasionally just for those rare moments. Um, so I figured, and I think it actually worked out very well in this hand. So I decided, you know, just one time, I would just, just fly call the ace king. Well, and it also implants that seed, especially if you're if you're thinking that this hand may end up going to showdown uh, in any way, shape, or form. You, you show down the ace king, and now they have the seeds of doubt whenever you call preflop. And does that help you at all? Yeah, I mean that's another point. You know, if it gets a showdown, you'll see that you're capable of doing that. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean. I decided if I'd rather him not know that I'm capable of doing that or let him know that I am capable of doing that. Because on the one hand, if he thinks you're capable of doing that, you can represent uh, ace-king in more situations. You can't only represent it when you rear it. You can right. sometimes represent it on a bluff if, uh, if you fly call. But even then, he's still going to think that I call with it very rarely. So I don't know that I can actually credibly represent it on a bluff um, in future hands. Um, but if I were playing against somebody who, you know, who didn't know me or who thought I was pretty bad and they got they got to see me just when I called Ace King they probably think I was pretty bad so that would be, <laughs> that'd be a pretty big bonus <laughs> that's a bonus it's always a bonus when people don't think you're very good <laughs> at the game yeah <laughs> that's why we relish the moments when they type in that you're a donkey in the chat box right <laughs> yeah or in their notes you know, it's like those are those are when that happens it's like, that's really good you shouldn't give some about <laughs> you should encourage them oops sorry <laughs> Well, so the yeah. flop comes down, and it, you hit a king, so you have top pair, top kicker, and you end up checking. Yeah, it's a king 10 deuce. Um, I decided to check because my plan was basically to check raise and then bet all three streets. Um, because this flop especially, there's not very many hands I can have um, to check raise for value and then bet all three streets. Because he knows I would re-raise ace king. Or, you know, quote unquote, knows I'd re-raise ace king. And he knows uh, I'd probably re-raise king queen too and maybe even king jack so he has to think if jack raising that board the only value hands I can really have are king 10 uh, pocket deuces um, or maybe even uh, king goose suited but he might think I've filled that pretty well um, so I check and he pots it for 120 and I make it 400 so it's interesting that he made it then he re-raises to 1200 straight um, and I have a tough decision because oh, I have another important part in this hand that we started we started very deep. This is, we, I had 6,600 in cover. Um, so this is a pretty tough decision, actually. I don't think full is really an option. Um, but then again, neither is re-raising. Because if I re-raise, like, I'm just going to get it in X so often because his range there for raising has to be, you know, big draws and then, like, monster hands and maybe some bluffs. But, you know, he's never going to be re-betting that flop with a that crush. He's never going to be doing that with, like, I mean, I, I should say, if he's doing that with a hand that I have crushed if, when he three bets that flop, it's because he's bluffing. When I four bet him, he's going to fold. He's never going to do that with a hand that he's value betting. So he's never going to have like king queen there when he right. bets that flop because he makes no sense because he knows I would never call with a worse hand then. Um, or like he's uh, very very few. Okay. I still think I have to call and basically see what develops. On later streets, my hand is too strong um, to fold at this point. Uh, even if I had a weak a weak king, I would still think it's the same. Um, so I decide to I decide to just uh, just call the three bet. Okay. And then the turn comes seven of clubs. Turn comes seven of clubs, and obviously the the action on the previous street. Your initial plan was to check raise and then continue firing turn and river, but obviously the 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 outcome of the flop check raise kind of slowed you down a bit. <laughs> right. I mean, I can't really, I can't, I can't just go full speed ahead anymore. Once you three bets that flop, I have to kind of just slow down and evaluate 
to make a decision based on his action on later streets. And it's going to be, I, basically, I had called the attention of making a, a very tough decision either way on the turn or the river, depending on what you did. Okay. So, I mean, you check on the turn, and then he checks behind. Now where do you put him? After he after all that betting on the flop, and now he's checking behind on the turn. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an important point that there was also a flush draw on the flop. Right. Which makes, and the turn is 7 o'clock, so it's a flank. Um, but it, that's important because it, the fact that he checks behind when there's a flop up on a pretty draw-heavy board makes it really unlikely that he, he's slow playing as they can. Um, makes it, I'm pretty, almost 100% sure at that point that I have the best hand when he does that. Um, and really, I mean, what would, why would he check behind King 10 on the turn? It makes no sense. Um, I think it would be a pretty tricky play and it might actually work. It'd be pretty, I mean, I, like I said, it would work because I, because I immediately thought I had to have the best hand when he checked behind. Right. Um, but at the same time, I don't think he was quite, he would have done that. It, I mean, that, that's a really risky play to check behind there with a set or, a monster hand because you're just not only is it that your opponent might catch up to be but also you're just going to lose a ton of action on your hand if the river comes you know like a, any diamond or an right. ace or a nine hands were, were basically the most obvious draw gets there right so so now I mean he either has a monster and he lets you catch up or he has a monster and the river brings one of the draws and now your opponent could think that you were drawing the entire time and you caught up so either way you kill your action basically is what you're saying yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, if, if I have a slightly worse hand than him, you know, a big, a really big hand, slightly worse, like, if he, for example, had a set of 10, set of kings, set of deuces, and I had king 10, he'd want to bet that turn and get it right away. Right. So, there's no, no real reason to, to do anything else. Um, and if I had a draw, if I had any kind of draw, of course, again, he'd want to get it in. There's no real reason for him to, um, to check behind so I can catch up my draw, because there's going to be a lot of, like, really big draws when I after I check raise that flop, and I can have, I can have someone like jack, jack out of diamonds, in which case I have 15 out to improve. And it'd be pretty stupid for him to just check, to check behind there, if I have right. his hand. Um, but they also, I, I, I also forgot to mention that the seven club will put up a second flush draw, so there's lots of flush draws that are out there. <laughs> um, there's two flush draws, and two ways for me to have, or three different ways I can have, uh, an open and a straight draw, two double batters and one open and a straight draw. And about a million ways I can have a flush draw. So check me on that turn with a big hand, just almost, they almost have to roll it out. Okay. And so you said that basically his check behind uh, pretty much assured that you that you probably had the best hand. Out comes the river, mm-hmm. which is the five of clubs, which the only flop, uh, the only draw that that completed was a backdoor, an improbable backdoor club draw. So now you got to think that you still have the best hand. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's improbable, but I think one of the common mistakes people make is always assuming that backdoor flush draw is somehow more unlikely in situations where it definitely could, could have happened. Like, if he decided to, to three bet me on the flop with like a total bluffing hand, maybe like something like eight clubs, and he turned that, that big club draw, there's a good chance that he'd second behind, take the free card, and hope to lay a big pot on the river. You know? So it's not exactly a blank. It's, okay. it's, in fact, um, I'd say, you know, a club draw might even be a little bit more likely than a diamond draw for him because okay. in order for him to have a diamond draw, he would have had to three bet the flop and then shift behind the turn after showing so much strength, which I don't know that he would do. Um, but, it, you know, he could have easily three bet that flop with just air and would have to have two clubs and then gotten that, gotten that draw on the turn and decided um, to, to check behind because I think he'd be a little bit more likely to three bet with, with air than with just some random flush draw when we're especially when we're six, 6,600 deep there but that's, that's, a bit, that's also a bit presumption so I can't be sure about that but either way um, I think it's a really good spot for me to, to value that and I think a big mistake check and hope he bluffs because once he checks behind that turn I don't think he will, he will think he's incredibly bluffed that river because he's going to know I very often have something to show and um, or if I don't if I miss a draw then he's probably just going to check behind if he has any kind of showdown value at all so if I bet, I think it looks much more likely that I'm trying to win the pot with a hand that has no showdown value. You know, something like Miss Diamond right. or a uh, jack, like Jack Queen, something like that. Um, and I, basically, if I do that, I think I can get a call from a lot of hands, which would basically think that I'm bluffing and pretty much any hand that could be to bluff might call me. Okay. So I decided to bet 1900 on the river, and he ended up calling with Ace High. So there you go. I mean, yeah, basically your plan worked like a charm. You bet just enough to make him think that you could have been bluffing with any kind of misdraw. So, 
Well, the fi- the final hand that you sent us here, um, it's another six-handed table, and you were dealt uh, Jack Eight suited. Can you talk about that hand? Yeah, um, this one actually is a six max game. It's uh, it's folded. There are first player folds, and then uh, second act opens for a hundred at twenty five fifty. Which the specific player he does that a lot. He makes a lot of win raises. So it's not you know out of the ordinary to see him do that. Uh, and then the button calls for a hundred, and I call and I'm with Jack Eight suited, which is pretty pretty standard. Uh, I see him in the full size raise one seventy five or something. I probably would fold in this situation, but it's only seventy five more. I'm getting a good price, and I have a pretty good. Uh, pretty good deceptive drawing hand, so I call even though I'm out of position, and there's a big blind call. And the flop comes, uh, king of spades, two of spades, six of diamonds, and I have jack eight of spades. Um, so I decide to lead out, because my full show's not really that great, so it would be kind of, I wouldn't be too comfortable just check calling with it, because then, even if I hit my flush, I'm not going to necessarily win a big pot, it's a very obvious hand, but if I lead out, uh, there's a good chance I can just take the pot down right now, and I might be able to isolate against somebody when it's just a one pair hand, and then my, the strength of my draw goes up basically because I get hit. Okay. I get my draw, I get much more comfortable with it. It's a much stronger hand than if it's been a four way pot or something like that on the turn. Well, and. Um, so uh, I decided- as far, as far as the preflop action goes, were you could you put your, any of your opponents on any kind of hands after that kind of action? There's not really there wasn't really much there, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of silly to, to try to put people on exact hands or even you know specific ranges at all when that happens. I mean, the guy who open to prevent from second to act. I mean, he, he can do that with like you know probably thirty percent of his hands or twenty five percent of his hands, something ridiculous like that. So it's ridiculous. I thought, okay, I think he has box aces or something. Right. Because he does that with he iterates a lot. Because then the guy calls with a button again, like he can have any hand. Because he can have, I mean, he can have probably like ace eight plus, you know, king nine suited plus any any suited king maybe. He might even have, you know, any suited ace, uh, any box pair. A lot of big connectors, big broadways, you know, suited one gappers. <laughs> the guy's just range. So, so, so it doesn't narrow it down very much. <laughs> yeah, like it's just, it's kind of silly to, to try to like, make it super specific because I mean, what's the point really and especially the big blind right I mean, he can literally have anything because it's a min raise a call a call and it's to him and he has to call 50 more to a pot of uh, 350 so he's getting 7 to 1 so right. he's call a healthy range of hands so I wouldn't <laughs> begin to try to put him on hand <laughs> okay well so let's get back to the flop then you flopped to the flush draw and you decided to lead out for 300 and you get called in two spots yeah, uh, the big blind calls me and the pre-flop raiser calls me. Um, and that, what that tells me is that um, both of them probably have, you know, a good one pair hand but n- or maybe a draw, but not a monster. Because I would expect, uh, the big one could have a monster, could have a set hoping the guy behind him would raise. Um, but when the pre-flop raiser over calls, you pretty much can't have something like a set of kings or a two pair or anything like that. So... If he could have a he could have a draw, but even then, I think he'd, he'd be more likely to raise if he had a sex of spades. Uh, if he had like, because that's I mean that's a pretty strong hand on that board. Uh, and you want to try to take the bat in the pot, or if not, then uh, I mean he might actually try to to play a big pot with just a that flush draw. Although you know, actually, I take back that statement because I just looked, I just looked back at the stack sizes and we're all two hundred big blinds deep. Um, so because of that, there's a good chance he could still actually have just an a sex flush draw, clean mm-hmm. flush draw. Um, yeah, but uh, so I get called in two spots, and the uh, the button falls. And then the the turn brings out a jack, which pairs you. So now you have top pair and a flush draw. How does that change things? Yeah, um, you know I, yeah, I mean this is this is one of those situations where even though you have a pair and a flush draw, it's not quite the same like as my pair and flush draw when I had the nine six of club. This is a bit different because what happens is I check, and then the big blind bets out pretty big. He bets twelve hundred into pot of. I don't know, 1500, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, 1600, I think. Uh, and it's folds, and it's the pre flop raiser folds. So I'm pretty sure he had, he might have had something like a, a weak king or uh, maybe something pocket queens. Um, you know, maybe, or maybe he had like a low flush draw and decided to, to bitch it. Um, but I, you know, it comes back to me and I have to decide basically if, you know, if his range is just entirely comprised of um, big draws and, and big hands, and obviously I would fold, but I, Quite often, he's just going to have some sort of one pair hand, like a king with a bad kicker or something, trying to protect his hand against flush draws. Um, or he could even have something like uh, maybe like something like king six or something like that. In which case, I still actually have 
a couple extra outs. I can hit a, I can hit a jack in addition to my nine flush draw outs. And plus, I think he's gonna, it's going to be hard for him to actually put me in. And he might actually think I wouldn't call the turn of the flush draw for that big of a bet. So I can actually, you know, if I if I hit, I might be able to uh, to get a nice size of pass him, um, depending on, on, how, on how he reads me, basically. So I decided to make the call. Okay. And just to clarify, I said that you had fl- you had a top pair in the flush draw on the turn here when, like you clarified, you have actually a mid pair in the flush draw. So, uh, yeah. okay. And then the river, jack of hearts, now you have trips. You don't make your flush, but you have trips. Um, how do you rate your hand against this opponent? Well, I mean, I got to think I have the best hand. There's only basically two hands that beat, or three hands that beat me, realistically. Um, five twos, five sixes, and king jack. Um, and, you know, to go on that prone, to, in order for him to have pocket twos or pocket sixes, you got to think that he had, that he, um, that he just slow played him on the flop and just called poking some of the raised kind, which sort of like, I mean, it's, it's definitely possible, but when you're, when you're deciding on someone's range, it sort of lowers their, uh, lowers the likelihood of that. So right. there's those range of hands for as far as beating me. And then he also has, you know, he has missed flush drop and he has, um, he has, uh, Random things in his range, maybe even the hundred fifty king six or king deuce. Um, those are possible hands that he could have. Um, so I, did, I decided actually to lead out, and I think a bit a lot of people may clean myself. Is actually one of the bigger mistakes I make um, on a regular basis. I think is that I often if, if my opponent has like the betting lead, you know, if I check call the turret, I sort of make the decision that that I'm going to check quickly on the, on the river if I actually. Hit my hit my dream card basically because I figure if they're going to bet and I can check raise or I can you know but in this spot my hand isn't good enough to check raise certainly not but it's also way too strong to check call I think um, I like leading out a lot because when you think about it he's only going to raise he's only never going to bluff raise me um, the only hands he's going to raise me with are pretty much exactly the hands that I talked about before deuces sixes and king jack and he'll probably raise every time with those hands. Um, so I don't really have to worry about that. There's enough back to that situation I was talking about before where you can just like, where you can break down somebody's range to different parts. And when you know that one, there's, there's just one set part of their range where it just doesn't matter what you do. You know, you can, you can, if I, if, if I had check called or if I had that and he had raised, it makes no difference when he has pocket twos or pocket sixes because I'm going to fold if he raises the river anyway. And if I check, he's going to bet 2800 and I would have called and I would have lost to those. So I don't even have to worry about those hands. Okay. Um, so basically, I would decide how to maximize against hand, like the counterfeited two pair, or just you know a king, a king ten, something like that, king nine. And I think in general, uh, or or I could decide maybe he might bluff if, uh, with this with a missed draw if I check. But in, in retrospect, I don't think he would bluff a missed draw. Um, it's a very bad card to bluff. Um, he can't really credibly represent many hands. Just like I said, he can only have deuces, sixes, or king jack. So I wouldn't expect him to bluff there very often. So because of that, I like leading out because then I think you might get a hero call from from a king. And in addition, if you lead out or if you had checked those hands that might call you the king X hands, they would always check behind that river. There's no value in the best for them. So right. you're not gonna you're not gonna by checking, you're not gonna get the value out of a check call. You're just, most of the, what most of the time is gonna happen is you're gonna check and he's gonna check behind. So I think leading out here is definitely the best play. Um, and at that 2800, he called and he ended up having just a weak king. He had king eight. All right. Well, that's all the hands. I really appreciate you doing this interview with us. That was a lot of really good information. Thank you very much. No problem. It was enjoyable. <laughs> it was enjoyable. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, and, on, <laughs> and thank you guys for watching the Online Zone on Card Player TV.